Good afternoon. Stand by uh, while I start very shortly. All right, there I go. I just wanted to alert those on my Twitter and those on my Facebook that I'm going live. This will be my third time going live on YouTube. I have three important topics to talk about. And those topics are the fiction of George Laming, the nonfiction of George Laming, who just passed away on the fourth Saturday, this past Saturday, and the power of the amazing work, the power of the amazing work of Genius, a trilogy about Kanye West, the Gemini Kanye West, whose birthday is the 7th of June. Uh, tomorrow. Um, particular things I want to bring up about that particular film. But first, I wanted to talk about who I am. You know, I'm a teacher. I'm also a writer. I'm a writer and I'm a teacher. One of the first books I taught um, in Caribbean literature, I taught Caribbean literature for two to three semesters at several different schools. Um, at Temple, Yes, at Temple University, it was in the spring of 2010 semester, I taught this novel, In the Castle of My Skin. And it is a novel about, based on the experience I found of George Laming himself growing up in Barbados before he moved to Trinidad. And it's an amazing novel, In the Castle of My Skin. Um, what I find amazing about it and all the talk about George Laming on Twitter on social media is that it celebrates the power of the people. It celebrates the power of the people. And there are two particular excerpts I want to read of the novel and then an excerpt of an interview by George Loving himself. And so basically the whole novel of In the Castle of My Skin, and it really talks about having pride and coming from the peasant class. That's why I love this novel. I taught it and I got what George Laming was saying. There is dignity among the peasant class. Tony Martin writes about the peasant class that Marcus Garvey represented in his book, Marcus Garvey Hero. And the dignity of the peasant class is what I feel um, the worker uh, without whose labor our society would fall apart. You know, the peasant, the dignity of um, being in the peasant class, coming from that class, the dignity. And George Laming wrote to that. Um, I want to thank Dr. Shirley Toland Dash Dix, the African American professor I had in grad school, who introduced me to George Laming along with other Caribbean authors. And I believe she used this edition. And within about four years of taking her class at, uh, University of South Florida, I was in a position where I taught Caribbean literature at Temple, not at U University of South Florida, but at Temple University. And I had some amazing students. I taught, one of the novels I taught was this, In the Castle of My Skin. He's real clear, George Laming, about the strength of the peasant class. I think that's a big theme throughout all of his work um, from going to Barbados to Trinidad. Then he moved from Trinidad to England and where he became a recognized writer. And he was very vocal about how much African-American writers influenced him, particularly Richard Wright. Um, and he speaks to that. But I just want to read this excerpt of, this excerpt is between the narrator, who is Laming himself, and Trumper, who's kind of like his friend, but who is fearless. I think it's a similar relationship to the main character, Milkman, in Morrison's Song of Solomon and Guitar. That relationship between Milkman and Guitar is similar to La Ming's narrator, who doesn't have a name, and Trumper, 
who's like an older, more braving, more dare, more brave, more daring figure. This is page 295. I like it, I said. That was very beautiful. You know the voice, Trumper asked. He was very serious now. I tried to recall whether I might have heard it. I couldn't. Paul Robeson, he said, one of my greatest of my people. And um, he writes, Laming writes in a Bayesian uh, dialect that I can't get. I can't. And that's another reason why I appreciate Laming. He taught me to write fearlessly in the culture, the Caribbean culture you come from. He wrote in that Bayesian dialect, Laming. You knew when you were reading it and when you were saying it out loud, you were speaking the Bayesian people, the Bayesian people's sound. Um, the Bayesian people's cadence, and he captured it. And reading him just was another motivating factor to make me write in Jamaican dialect, among other writers. Laming wrote in his people's dialect. Paul Robeson, Trumper said, one of the greatest of my people. What people, I asked. I was a bit puzzled. My people, said Trumper. His tone was insistent. Then he softened into a smile. I didn't know whether he was smiling at my ignorance or whether he was smiling his satisfaction with the box and the voice and above all, Paul Robeson. So that was an excerpt. The second excerpt I want to share is from this, try to get my screen a little bit bigger. Well, when I read it, this is the moral of the whole novel. When we think about in the castle of my skin, like if I were to tell someone who just wanted a quick rundown version of before they read it without spoiling anything. You know, what's the whole point of the novel that Lamming wrote? I would probably refer them to this page that I have up here. Um, I believe it's towards the end. It's towards the end that Lamming really tells you the power of his people and the moral of the story. The, towards the end of the novel, you really get the idea that they're fighting for the land before the big foreign companies come over and take over the land in Barbados. And this is again, a conversation between the narrator and Trumper. And I wanna begin with what, well, a little earlier, let me see, I should begin a little earlier. There are others involved, I said. I, the narrator, know some of them. Of course there is, said Trumper. There's always more than one in this kind of deal. They ain't surprised me. The man who set me thinking is the landlord, Tramper said. I don't quite understand why he take that risk. He take a good risk. What? Uh, he take a good risk. What risk? I didn't see any risk in the sale of the land. The risk he takes, said Tramper. There ain't no reason under the sun why he should have sell this land to slime. And that's where La Ming is really showing how, this was written in 1983. He's introducing a new thing to the novel and that is the danger of uh, sale to foreign entities, you know? And so he creates a moral feeling in this moment in the novel that uh, the landlord has let the people down by selling the land to Mr. Slime. And of course, Laming's choice of slime already tells you where he stands, Laming stands with the, the role of landowners. I don't know, said Trumper. Uh, I don't understand what you mean by risk, I said. I don't see any risk. And this is the narrator who, of course, not as radical as Tramp Trumper. I don't know, said Trumper. Perhaps I use the wrong word. You call it what you like. But why the landlord sell that land to slime, we'll find out one day. Tramper already knows but he is just getting his people to question the reasons that landlords sell to big money, that land is sold to the big hotels in the Caribbean, that land is sold to the big um, North American um, industrialists. You know, he questions the reason. But remember, Trumper says to the narrator this, this world is a world of camps and you got to find out which camp you're in. And above everything else, Keep that camp clean. When I was young, my father used to ask me, what's the moral of the story? And I believe for in the castle of my skin, right here is the moral of this story. Keep your camp clean. Keep your camp clean. That's why so much happened in the story of the novel that got you to sympathize with the people, that got you to sympathize with the narrator, 
who is like every man that got you to love Trumper and see his value. So we thank George Laming for his fiction. That's not the main reason I appreciate George Laming. Similar to Morrison, similar to Baldwin, what was amazing about Laming was his nonfiction. And if you don't know anything about Laming, I highly encourage you to buy this book, uh, The George Laming Reader. And you know, readers, what readers are, are a cross section or a medley of all the important or significant writings of that writer. And if you want to know um, the most important things written by Lao Ming, get this, the George Lao Ming reader. One of the interviews that Lao Ming does in this reader is between an interviewer named Kent. And I thought there were so many tidbits like Lao Ming is a writer's writer. Like if you want to learn how to be a writer, read how he has studied the writers before him. Some of those you on this YouTube live have already known about, have already seen. So check him out. Check out Lao Ming. Check out George Lao Ming. See who has influenced Lao Ming and made Lao Ming to be the writer, the novelist, the essayist, the interviewee that he so powerfully is. Um, he deals with this question of exile, the consequences of exile, when one leaves contributes when one leaves the island with an amazing brain power like him what happens to the island what are the consequences of a so-called brain drain and now that the resources have left the island he grapples with this george laming grapples with this kent interviewed laming said you have mentioned in our conversation several writers you responded to are there any black writers who jarred your perspective your no who jarred means touched or troubled your perception or imagination. La Ming responded, I think it came later. I think Wright, Richard Wright, was perhaps the major of all Black writers. And something I must say is that the Black writing from the United States was a very, very small part of the experience for myself and people like me in the Caribbean. This is an example of one of the most interesting developments in recent times. It was not really a part of our world at all. In 1953, Blyden Jackson told me that when he read In the Castle of My Skin, it was the first time he had read a book by a Black man outside of the United States. That was in 53, especially a personal narrative. Speaking of right, the other day I came across an exercise book I used as a young boy to jot down things that struck me about writers of books, etc. I would in fact copy, not just make notes to return to passages out of them. I was looking through this exercise book, which should, which would probably have a date like 1948. And I found pages and pages of black boy written out in ink. I remember very well this long section where Wright is reflecting about leaving for the North. So the fact that this is the part, the reason that I showed this uh, excerpt of La Ming's interview is because La Ming said that he actually wrote down parts of the novel, Black Boy by Richard Wright, you know, and this was part of what led him to be as descriptive as he was. Because if you know anything about Richard Wright, incredible Virgo uh, writer, incredible novelist, incredible detail that, you know, he directs your emotions the way that La Ming does with um, the whole scene with the flood in, 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 the, in, in the castle of my skin. You're really rooting for the people to survive the flood. You're rooting for them not to have the storm completely ravage their lives. So I'm grateful for um, George Laming and the examples that he's demonstrated. If you're watching this live, please comment. And I'm expecting, I'm commenting right now and I'm saying basically, please comment on the, on the, on the YouTube stream. So I'm anticipating it. If comments come up, I'll absolutely see them. Wow, what a film, what a film. What, a, what an amazing three-part film um, that I saw. I believe I saw it two weeks ago on Netflix and it's called Genius, a Kanye Trilogy. Um, I was powerfully affected by this 
documentary. I was so affected, I didn't even know where to start. Um, I took so many notes um, on this novel, on this film, on this film. Cody Williams uh, is the co-producer. He was following Kanye West from the beginning of his career and the footage from the early 2000s just struck me because um, I remember when I was living in the Bronx, I was told I looked like Kanye by one of my neighbors. And then because I was told that, <laughs> I went out to buy the College Dropout album. Um, and there were certain songs to me that appealed, but the only one that stuck with me was the sample he used from Shaka Khan's Through the Fire, um, Through the Wire. And, and then my cousin informed me on the power of his story, which the documentary went into how he survived the car accident, but did not let that car accident stop him from um, being the artist that he is. And um, two particular things that really struck out, stuck out to me uh, during this film. Um, I, I wrote down so many quotes. It's not, it's not even funny. And, and, and so many feelings while writing this. Um, seeing his mom rap with him in that scene in the kitchen when he's in his mom's kitchen and him is, I wrote down here, the best example of parenting I've seen in my life because his mom was devoted to him developing his craft. His mom supported his artistic craft. I've never seen a parent know their child's work in that much depth um, that I saw Kanye's mom know her son's work. And then when you say they have a footage, they have a scene of her and him on the Oprah show. And the way that Oprah looks at um, Donda West, Kanye's mother, oof. and um, the way that one shot of them, three of them, well, really two of them, um, the way Oprah looks at Kanye's mom and the way that, um, the way that Kanye's mom, Miss Donda, is looking at Kanye perform on the Oprah show, it's like, I've never seen that energy before. It was, it meant something different to me in 2022 than when it was first aired, you know, in the early 2000s on the Oprah show. Um, that was really, um, that was really powerful. Um, this, <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of emotions and I have to be respectable. I know I'm on this respectable YouTube, so I, I'm, what I'm thinking about, I'm hesitating because I can't say everything that this film made me feel because it was overwhelming. Um, I was catching up to the feelings as I was feeling them when I was watching this amazing film about his uh, commitment to being a professional artist. That's what I would call this film, you know how one becomes a professional artist, despite the naysayers, despite the industry ignoring you, despite the industry dismissing you at so many turns. This is a, this is a, uh, this film is a blueprint as to how to be, how to live as a artist. Uh, Cody, yeah, Cody was the main filmmaker and a lot of, most of the film comes from his footage. However, one thing I noted, um, I want to name all the producers because other than Cody Williams, it's clear that the I wrote a manuscript about the films uh, produced by Stanley Nelson. And what I said in the manuscript, I'm, I'm still looking for it. I may have to rewrite it because I just can't find it. It's been about 13, 14 years since I started the manuscript and I was going, going, going. <laughs> But what I was saying is in that manuscript, which is relevant to this film, there is such thing. I, I, re, I, bring, I bring this subject up again. I've written about it in my unpublished manuscript on Stanley Nelson. And I wrote about it in my book review of um, Peniel Joseph's book on, on Kwame Ture. And that is what I call an imperialist lens or a bourgeois lens. And what becomes clear as one watches this film, especially in the third part, is the dramatic difference between the lens of Kanye, the artist, the dedicated artist to his work, to his craft, 
and what I call a bourgeois lens, which is a lens that from what I'm seeing in the film, the filmmaker is beginning to adopt a more bourgeois lens, especially by the end. What struck me was the scene in um, this film, the trilogy, part three, when the um, Cody, the filmmaker, uh, puts his daughter in front of a television and is saying that Kanye's remarks um, essentially demean women and demean little girls. Basically, that's the basic message. And that for me was a stretch. Then I was like, uh, I don't think so. I don't think Kanye as a father of daughters is doing what this documentary is basically suggesting that he's doing, that um, Kanye stands on abortion, which is pro-life, which I personally don't agree with. But Kanye's stance on abortion is producing a negative image for young girls. That's basically, he has, you know, he set up Kanye's image on the television and then Cody Williams' daughter looking at the TV. And that's what, mm, I think that, I thought that was a jump. You know, I didn't agree with that. So that got me to writing and writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. And what I found is the, the theoretical approach, theoretical approach to Kanye's life as you go from part one to part two to part three becomes more and more bourgeois. It becomes more and more white liberal and it becomes more and more for me, incredible and not believable. And so I had to look at, you know, besides Cody Williams, who were the other executive top, 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 producers of this film, this three-part documentary. And they are Mike Beck, Lynn Benioff, Carmen C. Mar Marjorie Clark, Alexa Conway, Kate Ferrugato, Kate Ferragudo, pardon my pronunciation, Ross Martin, Peter Pham, uh, Connor Shell. You know, most of these are white producers. And so K Kern Shireson, Rebecca Title, Leah Thomas, Angus Wall. And so I named how many? And so by the time you get to Cody, it's already their money and their lens. So by the time part three comes around, Kanye is criminalized. And I didn't like it because I don't see him as a criminal. I don't agree with him politically, but he's not a criminal. And I don't appreciate seeing <laughs> or the suggestion that he makes little girls feel like, you know, they don't have, you know, they're bad. Because that's the, that's what the suggestion is. When Cody put his daughter in front of the TV and then narrated some negative narrative about how um, he's um, Kanye is threatening or endangering young girls. That's what the suggestion was, that, that Kanye's life is threatening or endangering young girls. So by part three, what makes this film super interesting is the fact that uh, he is made, Kanye is made into somebody who's crazy because he chose to use his power to enter political office. And he saw he could make Kanye the most impact as a Republican. Um, not because he likes the Republican Party, but because what was very clear in Kanye West's interview with Joe Rogan was that the Democrats, when very um, wealthy Democrats found out you know, he was running, they turned their backs and punished him and chastised him. And that's why we get so much negative, negative, negative news that's trying to emotionally manipulate, manipulate all of us to dislike Kanye. Um, and I just didn't buy that. I just didn't buy that. So I saw through the lens, I saw the beginning friendships between Cody Williams and Kanye, and I appreciated it. I thought that was a chance. But by the third part, I saw like, a divergence, a very serious divergence between Cody and Kanye. And that for me is what made the film interesting. Um, so with all these producers who managed by the end of the trilogy to make Kanye into this crazy person, all because he wanted to run for office and change the inequality, it's clear that Kanye's passionate about ending, liberating against um, capitalist um, oppression. And, and ending poverty and doing what he can with his money to eliminate poverty, to eliminate the racial wealth gap, to eliminate um, racial disparity. You know, he's very clear and passionate about that. Um, but the film makes him look like a fool for joining the Republican Party with the Make America Great Again. I mean, that is who the people who will support him wear. 
the people who will support him wear those hats. So he's choosing to, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. That was his choice. But I don't like the criminalization. I don't appreciate the criminalization of Kanye in, 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 in part three. So with all these white producers, how can we look at this film instead of from a wealthy industrialist or a wealthy conservative or a wealthy liberal's perspective, instead of looking at the film from a wealthy liberal's perspective, why don't we look at this, this, the film? Because what I tweeted the day I saw the film was I'm desperate to really look at Kanye through a Naeem Akbar, through a Kobe Kanban, through a Ayo Maria Gooden through a lens of not a wealthy conservative or wealthy liberal, but through a wealthy, through a black psychologist with a wealth of knowledge, through a lens of a black psychologist. So not only looking at film through this, but looking at novels through this. Two years ago, I published, co-published this book with my co-editor, Natalie King Pedroso. Critical responses about the Black family. And I look at Toni Morrison's novel not through the lens of um, Derrida or European psychologists, but Black American psychologists, per particularly Kobe Kanban. And so I just wanted to take a few excerpts here of Kanban's book. Kanban's book here is called The African Personality in America. It is very important. Um, it was given to me by a student of Kanban's. And then I read it and I saw the importance of black psychologists' perspective um, in treating, dealing with white supremacy. Now that it is popular in the lexicon, the society still has yet to catch up with the value of the work of psychologists, psychiatrists, such as Francis Cress Welsing, such as Dr. Kobe Kanban, who transitioned the year out. So I look at Morrison's work through a theory created by a Black psychologist named Kobe Kanban. And that theory is called African Self-Consciousness. How does Morris, what does Morrison's novel have to say about one's ability to develop in one's own African self-consciousness? And how does one's parent influence their child to either develop their self-consciousness or not develop their self-consciousness because they're basically, the parent is teaching them European values. And as much as I value Donda West for her incredible support of her son, and I feel like the universe is talking to me so deeply about being aware of parental support of children, being aware, and certain things were happening to me while I was, happen while I was watching the film, then let me know, wow, okay, I'm supposed to say something about parenting about this. Um, she supported her son incredibly. She was there, she knew her son's work, she promoted her son's work, she created a foundation for her son's work. Um, she even changed her body image to support the work of her son. And one thing Kanye West said in his interview with Joe Rogan was his lamenting the fact that when um, he was born, since the time that he was born, between that time and the time that his mother moved him to Chicago, he suffered the loss of the relationship with his father. Okay, He was no longer in relationship with his father when his mother moved him to Chicago. Um, he, he was not as much in touch. And the film doesn't really, there's, the film doesn't delve into the father's perspective as I thought it should. Um, it showed awesome footage of his mom. There was one scene with the father when Connie was already a star. I wanted to see him, I wanted to see him and his father before the stardom, okay? We should have seen him and his father have a relationship on Father's Day, this theme yesterday was Father's Day. And that's why I really couldn't post yesterday because I was still, roiling over what I should say, whether I should say it, what I should say, whether I should say it. No, that film on Kanye should have included footage of Kanye with his dad before he became famous, before he became, because you get to really see where his own energy comes from in terms of how fiercely he defends himself um, against the lies in the media. That comes from what he saw with his father. That comes from what his father did and having to fight for himself, his father's self. So this is an incredible um, story 
um, that story that was missing that I thought from the film, from this film, was his father. What, where was Kanye's father before his stardom? Because definitely his father played a key role in his stardom. This quote is from Kobe Kanban's book about the African personality in America. I just wanted to read. In short, Kanban writes, African collective life achieves a very low value in the psychology of Europeanized African children. Basically, African children who have adopted the European mindset. This is not just an issue for the, well, he wrote this at the end of the 20th century. This is an issue for the 19th century. He's just, Kanban is just putting words to it. There were definitely Europeanized African children um, during the time of the Civil War, you know. Um, who did not want the union to um, include the Confederacy. You know, so this is a concept that we're talking about now, but has a universal relevance. Kobe Kanban writes, the Europeanized African child or personality is thus characterized by a weak ASC. ASC stands for African self-consciousness in their psychological infrastructure. Therefore, African nation building maintenance would be the very last item if it exists at all, on the Europeanized African child's agenda. And he's talking specifically about children who have been raised to think of themselves as a European by parents, by their parents, because their lives have been thrust or organized around the prioritization of European nation building slash maintenance. So this is what um, Kanban is mentioning. And, 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 and this, when I was watching the film on uh, the Kanye trilogy, I was like, oh my gosh. I was saying as much as his mother supported him, to what degree did Ms. Donda West uh, teach him to adopt European mentality? Definitely in, in Kanye's choice of, 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 of a lover or of a, of a partner in Kim Kardashian, to what extent, you know, to what extent do all of us, to what extent are all of us having a Europeanized mindset to find things that are beautiful, European. We've all been raised, you know, arguably by mainstream culture to only see European things as beautiful. Kanban writes the ultimate outcome or product of Eurocentric socialization and actuality cultural oppression of African children can only consist of African self-destruction, Kanban writes, which results from the prioritization of European nation. I already said that. Okay, and then that last quote there, I wanted to see if I could enlarge, um, is basically from the uh, book that I wrote. Um, and in that part this particular book I wrote three years ago, and I'm talking about Hopkins' second novel called Hagar's Daughter. And the main character of that novel written in about, that novel was published in 1902. Yeah or 1901, um, the main character is Jewel Bowen, whose mother is trying to basically assimilate into wealthy society. I write that Kanban writes that cultural misorientation produces an African person with a dominant European self-consciousness. This is the majority of Africans we see on television. Um, European self-consciousness, they promote European survival thrust. And this is what makes myself, artists I love, including Kanye, so sympathetic. Um, uh, the fact that they're African, but they have a European self-consciousness. Um, this is a very real thing. This is why literature is literature, because it's really speaking to these themes. And this is why the critic's job is to really tease out in what ways do we see an African behaving as if they have European self-consciousness? In what ways do we see Africans supporting European survival threats? So that's all I wanted to say on today's YouTube. I'm grateful uh, for this film. I encourage you to see it. Part three is really wild because it's the divergent. It's a three-part trilogy. Um, and part three is the most wild because you see the difference between Cody and Kanye most. When Cody has basically joined, it seems to me, the white liberal funding camp of looking at Kanye as crazy and um, dangerous. And I don't see that. I see him as sympathetic. Somebody like all of us who has been um, raised to promote European, European survival thrust, especially when you see Kanye's behavior in showing um, his former wife, his ex-wife, a hologram of her father 
who is so problematic to me in terms of trying to profit off of um, the stereotype, which Toni Morrison herself wrote about in Birth of a Nationhood, of the black buck, which other writer, because her father basically made his name on the criminalization or the alleged criminalization of O.J. Simpson. Um, so there's so many implications of that that we see play out even in um, 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 the relationship of Rob Kardashian's daughter to Kanye West. But it, for me, it brings up um, to what extent are artists promoting uh, uh, European survival through us. And then I want to thank everybody um, for listening to me about the nonfiction of George Laming. And make sure you check out the Laming Reader. And make sure you check out the amazing book in the castle of my skin by George Laming. Okay, it's a powerful novel about awareness. And in many cases, it kind of speaks to the values of African survival thrust, you know. Um, George Laming is clear that once you know your history, you're gonna be more aware of how not to promote European survival thrust. And that is why um, the narrator is on the fence by the end of the novel, at the beginning of the novel, in the middle of the novel, but by the end of the novel, he learns to side with Trumper on, on protesting, resisting the sale of the land um, to Mr. Slime. So in that case, they're not about European survival thrust. So make sure you check the work of George Lambing out. Check out, check out uh, Genius, a Kanye trilogy. Be sure to like, subscribe, share, comment on my third YouTube live. God bless you.